There's a favorite short story of mine written by Flannery O'Connor called Revelation. It begins in a hospital waiting room where Miss Turpin, the main character, ranks other people from worst to best, including herself. The longer she waits, the more irritated she becomes with the people she sees as beneath her. At first, she tries to keep these judgments to herself, but slowly they creep out, first in gestures, then in passive-aggressive comments, finally in just plain, harsh words. The whole time, she's being watched by another person in the waiting room named Mary Grace. As the scene progresses, the animosity between Mary Grace and Mrs. Turpin comes to such a pitch that Mary Grace, fed up with Miss Turpin's prejudiced remarks and pious assumptions, throws her human development textbook directly at Miss Turpin's face. The violent act leads Miss Turpin to have a revelation of God's kingdom. She sees all the people that she despised march through the gates before her. And as they enter the kingdom, all the features she looked down on disappear. When she sees people like herself enter the gate, all that she admires about them, their air of self-importance and their pride in their hard work, also disappears. This is unsettling to her. Why would the things that she likes about herself disappear? Shouldn't she be justly rewarded for all the good deeds that she's done? How will she know who deserves more if all that distinguishes them is washed away? Miss Turpin only notices the good not justly rewarded, in her opinion, and never seems to grasp why someone with the name of Grace would throw a heavy textbook at her, shaking her awake and causing her to see things in a new way. But this is what grace does in our life. It shakes us awake from our own limited vision and forces us to see the world differently. When we experience a moment of grace, sometimes like a heavy textbook, it smacks us square between the eyes before we even knew what hit us. Grace reveals God's generous work in the world, and it might not always match our own vision for how things should be. The laborers who are called at dawn, like Miss Turpin, are quick to proclaim their right to greater compensation. These two stories reveal something about human nature that buried deep in each of us is this desire to make distinctions. Often in our culture, busyness becomes a way to measure someone's worth and make distinctions. We tend to equate busyness with importance. So we pack our schedules with lots of activities and work extra hours at our jobs so we can say, I have important things to do and important places to go. I am an important person. And when we're not busy, then maybe we start to wonder if we're as valuable as we once thought. If a person's worth is, the only, is only assessed by their output, then what about those who don't have the same opportunities or work? What are they worth? There's a danger in too closely valuing someone's worth by the heft of their weekly planners. Barriers begin to form and distinctions begin to be made not by God but by us. Thoughts begin to creep in like, I am worth more. I am worth more than that person over there. Or maybe, I am worth less. This is the world the day laborers live in. The more you do, the more you earn. Those who work the hardest should have the most respect and the biggest wage and that justly compensates their effort. By this logic, the last called are practically worthless. But this is not how the landowner sees them, and this is not how God sees us. The parable of the vineyard shows us a different vision for how the world can operate. When the workers receive equal pay, the distinction between those who were busy and those that were idle disappears. 
What separates the workers from each other is washed away by the landlord's generosity. And this is upsetting to the first laborers and doesn't satisfy their thirst for worldly justice. Likewise, in our Old Testament reading, when Jonah learns that Nineveh will be spared from God's wrath, he becomes upset at God's mercy and thirsts for human justice. He doesn't like the people of Nineveh and doesn't think that they deserve to be saved from destruction. Jonah knows that God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and it's upsetting to him. Jonah too cries out, not fair, when it comes to God's generosity. And it's true, mercy is never fair. And thank God for that, because without God's mercy, none of the laborers would have been called to the field in the first place, and no one in O'Connor's story would be seen marching through the gates of heaven, and the book of Jonah would be far less interesting. And none of us would be sitting here today without God's mercy in our lives. We all come to God as beggars. There is a wideness in God's mercy that surpasses any attempts to limit his abundant love for all people. A person's worth is not for us to determine, and our own value is not for us to judge. God is just, but God is also merciful. And God has his own way of doing this free from human systems of oppression and prejudice and hate. God sees worth in everyone and comes after each of us, offering the same reward. Salvation. Salvation from our selfish ways. Salvation from our limited view of the world. From our desires to rank each other as a little bit higher or a little bit lower than our neighbors. O'Connor had a keen understanding of how God's grace shatters us so that something transformative can rise up out of the shards. Through grace, our broken pieces are fashioned into Christ's image and we become whole once more. God calls us to reorient our lives away from the nature of the earthly kingdom that values busyness and personal gains above all else and towards the generous nature of the heavenly kingdom. What Matthew's parable shows us is that generosity is at the heart of our faith. This faith transforms us by sending us out into the world to follow the way of the generous landowner by being giving to, with our time, with our resources, with our money, and with our very selves. To acknowledge that God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love means that this generous nature must extend beyond our own needs. Jesus comes to turn us towards a vision of creation where all people receive new life. Like the landowner, he perpetually walks the marketplace seeking more workers, wiping away the barriers that separate us, and reshaping us in his image again and again. <laughs>